If you move the channel towards the side of the, the bog, it's better. But one of the big disappointments we had this year was the St. Truitt River. I mentioned that it was a unique genetic strain back in 2003. Uh, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe approached the federal government for some assistance in doing some sampling in the Mashpee River. They contacted me and I went out with the USGS on September 2nd. Took him, took him to the area that I went to with Brendan back in 2003. Went in there, we didn't find any trout. We found trout in the Mashpee, which I knew there was trout there since I moved him into the Coonabesset. We went to the St. Truitt, there was no trout. We kept on going, kept on going, in hopes that we would find a trout, and we didn't find a trout, which was very disappointing. Uh, I went back in in October with some interns from Patagonia, which were helping out the Sea Run Brook Trout Coalition in October, and we surveyed below Sampson's Mill Road, the area where I had captured fish with Brendan in 2003, but beyond the power lines, almost to Route 28, where the water starts to get warm in the summer. And once again, we didn't find any trout. Uh, so this was very disappointing. Uh, Jeff Day, who's the executive director of the Sea Run Brook Trout Coalition, uh, went out and collected water samples. And they're looking at this technique called environmental DNA, looking for traces of fish DNA in the water. And the latest results indicate that they didn't find any of the trout DNA in the water samples. So that's. Basically, very disappointing that we had lost this trout population in recent memory. Why aren't the fish here? Well, the St. Tuit River is a good indication of the death of a thousand cuts. There's a lot of things that have gone wrong in the St. Tuit River system uh, since 2003. There's been a major change in the St. Tuit Pond water quality. It went from a vegetation dominated system to a blue green algae dominated system, or an algae system. The road crossings have always been a problem there. They're undersized, they're blocking the water up. Uh, you have water withdrawals for golf courses. You have Willow Bend. This is a picture of the Willow Bend golf course here. Uh, there's also water supply for Ketuit, and number five well is there. One of the major things, they cleared the trees. The people went in there and they're trying to benefit the herring, and they've been clearing out all this wood. And it's one of my pet peeves that people are trying to benefit the herring. And oftentimes you go in and they clear the river out like a tractor trailer can go through it. You're only trying to get a 12 inch fish up through a little bit of wood. And these fish are adapted to it. That's how they evolved, is to wiggle through little pieces of wood. Uh, the other thing is you know, people trying to help out, uh, help out the birds. So somebody decided it would be a great thing to put a osprey nest right next to the river. Well, that's probably not a good thing if you're a trout to have a predator uh, house right next to your river. There's also the long-term problem we hear right in Cape Cod. Eelgrass uh, is gone in Chew Spring and Papanas Bay, where a lot of it's gone. So these fish that would have dropped down in the winter as salters in the winter, they get down there, there's no cover anymore. Uh, so they're once again susceptible to predation. Another thing when you're looking at uh, the long-term sustainability of these populations is other populations. If you're a wild brook trout stream up in the Berkshires and you get wiped out in one little tributary, other brook trout can come in and spawn in there. Here in these salter streams are isolated. Very few of the fish can go down through the salt water and successfully make it to another river. Uh, they have to be about six inches long before they're able to do it uh, through alcohol regulation. And even then, there's a lot of predators now. So the Quaker Run, uh, here's the San Truit River. They called it Ketuit back in the day as well. Quaker Run was a little stream that once supported brook trout that fed into the San Truit River. But you have to look at how things have changed here in Cape Cod back from, this was probably in the, uh, the 1940s or so. And to look at what's happened now, all kinds of development. Uh, we have the Willowbend Golf Course. They built these water structures for the uh, golf course as well as the Cranberry Box. So a lot of things have changed in the Quaker Run. And so it's like a domino. It's like you lose one domino and it hits the next one. The big thing is probably the temperatures there. I've been monitoring the temperatures since 2001 in the San Tuit River. This gives you an indication in September through May, the peak season for temperatures. I mentioned that 70 degree temperature. Well, in 2013, the average temperature during that month was 70 degrees. That's not the temperature at the 2 o'clock in the afternoon would be about 70. That's the average temperature over the whole month was 70 degrees. So based on what I know of the literature, uh, that's pretty warm. That in and of itself could have wiped out the trout population. 
But trout are survivors. I mean, if they were left to their own devices, they would try to find these little pockets. It's called behavioral thermoregulation. And so the trout can supply these little pockets of cold water to survive. But if somebody has gone in and cleared out the wood of the pocket where that groundwater is coming in, the fish is trying to survive, and the predator comes down, it's out in the open, that trout is gone. And each year, it probably went down little by little. I think the trout population was probably lost within the last five years in the St. Tuan River. So what are we going to do about it? It's basically, a, it's a huge problem uh, in terms of brook trout restoration. We're trying to restore them in the Childs and Kunameset. We've had some success, but we lost what was once a, a genetically unique population. So the first thing we've done is raise awareness of it. We're trying to make people aware of the loss of this, this resource. Uh, we had a front page article in the Cape Cod Times. Maybe some of you saw it. Uh, we've also had meetings with Brad Chase from the Division of Marine Fisheries, trying to get him on board with trying to rein in the people, the herring people that are clearing out these rivers in the name of herring. They're also doing damage to the resident native species like the trout. We've had meetings with the Wampanoag tribe. I mean, this is part of their cultural heritage was these trout in the San Juan River. Uh, so we just had a meeting with them. We're going to continue to look for the brook trout presence in the, the stream by that environmental DNA by electrofishing. Hopefully, some fish can move in from the Mashpee River and reestablish. They were closely related to the Mashpee River fish, uh, and hopefully someday enough fish will be able to make it up. But like I say, it's difficult uh, for fish to make it through these open estuaries right now to reestablish these populations. So it may take decades, if not hundreds of years, before they can reestablish themselves on their own, if the conditions are suitable. So one of the things that we're trying to do is develop a plan for the management of the river. Uh, there's a lot of players in this river. You get sent to it pond. I mentioned, if you look at the color here, here's yeah. Ashley Wakeley. <laughs> this sent to it pond, Kisu Cream. That might have had something to do with it as well. Uh, so there's a lot of different things. They built a new fish ladder up there. Uh, the trouble is these ponds get very warm in the summer. If you spill too much water in the summer, you can impact the water temperatures down below. At Redbrook, we control the fish ladder. I basically shut the uh, ladder off at the end of June after the herring were done, and I opened it again on October 5th. And so basically, I limited the flow of water out of the pond to reduce the water temperatures in the lower part. That might be something we can look at in some of these rivers. Uh, also getting people to stop cutting the wood, maybe actually put some wood back in. And if we get a management plan, and I see some improvements in the river, uh, then I'll think about moving fish from the back of the river in there, and hopefully we can reestablish the population. But I'm not going to risk uh, fish from the Mashpee and put them in a river that's not suitable. So I have to get everybody on board before I'm going to try to move fish back in. <coughs> this another thing, temperature is key. Here's the San River in 2015. You can see it's much warmer than the Quashnet in orange and the Mashpee in blue. But you see, even those rivers get pretty close to that uh, stressful limit for brook trout. Uh, so there's a lot of things we could do to improve the temperatures in these streams. Another thing I've been seeing recently is uh, more and more otter sign in the Mashpee River. And somebody's actually going in and cutting the river, cutting the wood in the Mashpee River now. I mean, I've always held this up as an example of what the rivers should look like. They should not look like this cut off branches. That's not the way rivers should look like. Um, and so that's one thing we'd have to work with the people that are doing this to try to get them to limit their cutting of the wood in the Mashpee and kind of uh, let things develop on its own. It's that woody structure that's very important for these brook trout. We have had some indications of um, continued wild brook trout. We found some brook trout that we first identified in 1990 in the Bocasset River up in Bourne. Unfortunately, it's a little section here above the ponds. Uh, so these fish actually can't make it back. If they go down into the ocean, they can't make it back. There's all kinds of ponds that they have to get through. But these fish still held on. In 1990, when I surveyed it, it had brown trout. The brown trout are gone. It's just the brookies, the, the native fish are surviving there. One good thing that we had happen this year, we actually found some wild brook trout in the Marston's Mills River. We haven't found any wild brook trout in there for years. Uh, I did find one brook trout a few years ago. I went down into the prime habitat where I expected there might be trout, and we found a few fish. It was like about seven fish that we got. 
but hopefully that's a, a remnant wild brook trout population in the Marston's Mills River. If we can get people once again to stop cutting the wood out, uh, to let shade trees grow up, maybe these trout will survive for the future. Because I've been sampling this river for years upstream and never found a trout. Some other streams that hopefully someday we might be able to restore fish by moving them in is uh, Fresh Brook in Wellfleet. It was known as Trout Brook at one time. In 1893, an artist, Frank Benson, went out there and caught a bunch of trout in below the railroad bridge, so right about here. Um, he caught all kinds of trout in the 1890s. Nowadays, there's no trout. We've got a couple of little largemouth bass in there. This is what Fresh Brook looks like right now. It's kind of a pond. And it's all caused by this little culvert right here. A little two-foot culvert was enough to change the habitat from a trout stream to a bass pond. Uh, just a little culvert like that. We've been working with the National Seashore. One of the things is most of this property is actually protected by the National Seashore. Hopefully we're going to get them on board uh, to try to make a cut or remove that culvert and allow cold water to reestablish itself. And if the cold water reestablishes itself, maybe we can move fish in there and once again have trout and trout brook and wolf leaf. Hear about the Kunimesk River. What can we do here? Uh, well, we moved in a fish down below here. This is actually a town-owned log with Thomas and Andrews Road. Uh, some of the things that we would like to see is actually move some of that habitat. They're confined in a little area between Sandwich Road and the bottom of this log right now. This is the habitat that those trout reproduced in. So if we can get some woody structure in here, maybe get a little bit of shading, we can extend that habitat up past Thomas Landers Road because the cold, the temperatures are cold enough at Landers Road, and so we can expand that area that's suitable for brook trout. Things to look at in the future is maybe bypassing Pond 14, allow some of that flow, particularly in the summer, to bypass the pond instead of warming up in the pond. You can flow around the pond. Uh, and when you're doing the restoration designs, incorporate those cold water refuge areas. So even if the main river gets too warm for trout, if you can have some cold water refuges with some woody habitat, some adult trout might survive during the summer. And one of the things that we're going to continue to do is to monitor the restoration. I'm going to go in there in May and look and see if these fish indeed spawn again and figure out if they are moving throughout the river. I believe they are. At this time of the year, the entire river is suitable for trout habitat. So there's probably some down in the lower bogs right now. But right now, the temperatures are still warm. Here's some of the data from 2014 at Sandwich Road. Here's that kind of 70 degree line, the magic 70 degree line. See this pretty good fluctuations during the day, uh, but it's cold. It's suitable for trout. The lower bogs sometimes gets up to 80 degrees or more. Uh, you can see that the fluctuation in the, is more in the lower bogs. You get that solar radiation in those open areas. So what do we have to do to save Cape Cod trout? Well, we've got to protect the existing populations. We have to restore the, the riparian zones and woody habitat. Restore the estuaries. Those coastal eelgrass beds were very important for these trout. We're going to mitigate somehow the impacts of our groundwater as well. Uh, everybody's competing for that same amount of water. If you're taking the water out, that would have been water that fed the stream and supported these brook trout. We're going to continue to monitor the temperatures and flows in the rivers. Uh, you might want to look at managing the outflows of the, from the ponds during critical periods when it's too warm. Remove barriers to fish passage and remove the dams that basically block fish passage. Try to restore populations to where we have cold water habitats. And keep in mind that, you know, I've talked about all the impacts here on trout, but there's some big, big picture things out there that could uh, spell doom for these fish in the long term, like climate change. Uh, and then kind of the emerging thing now is these endocrine disruptors in the ground and surface waters. All these septic systems on Cape Cod, all these chemicals, anything you use in your house basically gets dumped for the most part, uh, back in the aquifer on Cape Cod. And so that's one of the things that we helped out some scientists from a Pennsylvania university looking at some ponds this year and the impact of these endocrine disruptors in the groundwater on some of the pond fish. A lot of people are involved with this. Uh, that's one of the things more and more people are involved with it. Uh, we get a lot of partners. So a lot of people are interested in saving these fish. Uh, we always welcome new partners. If you're interested in more, I 
So just go into the Sea Run Brook Trail Coalition website and Facebook page. They got all kinds of information on it. And I'll leave you with a nice picture of Andy Jones of a Kunimesic River Brook Trail. Hopefully there'll be a lot more of these in the future. At this point I'll entertain any questions you have. So I think that uh, uh, some of this wood cutting that we see on these small streams are uninformed tubers, kayakers, yeah. people, uh, canoeists that want to get down these streams and they, and they go down with, with loppers and hatchets. It's yeah. yes, probably not a lot of them though, but uh, it's primarily the herring people, but there's also the people, the mosquito control. I've heard the Child's River, I heard a chainsaw going one day, and it was the Cape Cod Mosquito Control people in there as well. So there's a lot of people in there that are doing the cutting. Yeah, it, it looks at that shot, that quarter mile or so south of Thomas Landers Road, it doesn't look like it'd be very difficult as soon as the river goes under the, the road to mm -hmm. force it to the south against the upland, mm -hmm. where you'd have that nice mineral soil and somewhat colder water coming in, right. higher it, quality. That, that's is one that possibility. Thing to consider? It, it's something to consider. Uh, they also have there's a berm that was built as part of the um, fuel spill 28 cleanup. Um, and so if you just wanted to leave the existing river, um, you could grow some riparian trees on that berm. If it's a little bit higher elevation, you might be able to get some trees established. But uh, ideally, yeah, if you were, had all the money in the world and the time, you would want to move that channel to the side because that's where the cold groundwater is going to be coming in. Given the conditions that you described with the sand in the, the old cranberry mm -hmm. homes and the pitch pines coming back, are the pitch pines really a bad thing, um, would you say, or are they kind of neutral? Uh, they do offer some shade if they grow up. Uh, but like I say, it's not a natural riparian zone tree for the most part. I mean, if you look at the picture of the Santuit River, uh, it was beech trees. Uh, a large woody beech tree. I mean, that's the thing with these valleys. They were kind of sheltered from the fires that swept over Cape Cod. And it was one of the few areas where you had beech trees. Um, and so that was one of the most disturbing things about the Santuit. It, it looked like one of the best rivers out there because it had all these large growth beech trees in there. Uh, so ideally, you'd want more of the um, you know, deciduous trees like red maple, beeches, uh, that sort of thing. They come along anyway, though. I mean Somewhat. It all depends on the, uh, the elevations. Like I say, when you talk about the pitch pines, they're growing on that nice sandy soil. Uh, so the red maples like to get their feet a little bit wet. That's why we have them in red maple swamps. Uh, and so a lot of these cranberry bogs, even the Kunameset, you basically have a layer of sand and peat that's about this thick. And if you look at it, it's like little layers of peat where the vines have grown up and then layers of sand. We, they had sanded the bog every couple of years. Would you consider removing sand? Or? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that we're looking at at the um, Century Bog, is to and remove it. And it's a Kuna Mesa. Kuna moving up right. to three feet of sand. The, the trouble with that, I mean, is expensive. Uh, but if you don't do that, and you try to back the water up, you get the situation they had in the Eel River, where you get large amounts of shallow water. Uh, and that's not a good thing for a river system. And so if you... You know, you can impound some water back if it's isolated from the river itself, but along the river you probably want to remove some of that sand cap so you can get down to that we call it organic soil. Question about the genetics of these trout. Mm -hmm. um, I, using the Mashpee River, for example, do, do you believe the trout that are in the Mashpee River now are the same genetic strain that were in the Mashpee River in 1850, or, or are these some new genetic strain that was introduced when Dr. Ryder was pouring trout into all these rivers? Well, they all came from the sandwich hatchery. So they all basically came from the same spot. So these aren't, the, but those trout from the sandwich hatchery mm -hmm. were different than what was in the Mashpee River genetically. Right. So they, when these, when in 1850 mm -hmm. or whatever, when people would come down and catch uh, two and three pound brook trout mm -hmm. out of the Mashpee River, that genetic strain doesn't exist anymore. Uh, we don't know. We're hopeful. I mean, that's what the genetic work kind of gave us an indication that it might, in fact, be some of the original native strains. Uh, and that's one of the things these survivors, you know, we've been stocking hatchery brook trout in Massachusetts streams since 1866 or 1868 when we established the Maples Springs Trout Hatchery. 
Uh, and we haven't reestablished trout populations in most of our streams by the hatchery trout. And so that kind of gives an indication it's that native strain that's able to persist. But nobody really knows for sure. I mean, all this stuff, uh, I mean, nobody was taking genetic samples back there. There's some isolated samples out there, and Brendan tried to look at it, like up at the Museum of Comparative Zoology, uh, back in the day when they used to preserve stuff in alcohol rather than formaldehyde. Uh, but he wasn't able to get any DNA out of some of those old samples. So it's really tough to say. Uh, we're thinking they are probably the, the native strains, but we can't say for certain. But they, we know they're distinctly different from the hatchery strain. And that's one thing, if you raise a fish in the hatchery for a long, it basically kind of loses that uh, ability to survive in the wild. If you're a fish in the hatchery, you see a shadow, you want to get there, because that's the food pellets coming down. <laughs> if you see a shadow in one of these streams, you better get out of here, because it's probably the osprey that's going to be here. Last sight is that Austrian comes down with its talons or that great blue heron stabs you. So we're hopeful, but we can never really know for sure. So the hatchery um, brook trout aren't probably are not able to go through osmoregulation. They can't go out in the salt water. Well, they, they actually probably can because some of the earliest work done down here at Woods Hole uh, by a guy named Steve McCormick, he actually used fish from the sandwich hatchery. And basically he found that they had to be about 150 millimeters, six inches in size, before they were able to tolerate uh, the salt. And one of the things that we're finding out with all this work is they go down for brief periods of time. Um, and one of the things that I have been seeing in Red Brook, uh, which I'll have to develop some graphs to show people, is I actually have movement showing fish being impacted by that warm salt water. And I think it's the warm temperatures that's making them move, but I plotted uh, the temperature or the movement data on an hourly basis and I looked at it and like, huh, those fish moving during the day, this day it was here, the next day it was an hour late, and the next day it was basically a line. And so basically the fish were reacting from that warm water coming in in the summer uh, and moving up. Uh, but in terms of the osmoregulation, they can do it for the hatchery fish, it's probably um, part of their genetic structure. But whether there's any differences between the rivers, like I say, there's a lot that's not known about yeah. these fish. Most of the work that's been done on Sea Run Brook Road is done up in like Nova Scotia or Canada, where they still have fairly intact populations. Here they're very limited. Marston's Mills back in the early 1800s used to be called Good Steeds for the major family there. Uh, Marston was actually a man who married into the family, and then the good Steve being sort of went away and it became Marston's Mills. There are records of brook trout being caught there um, that are probably closer in time to J.B. Smith, Smith's time mm -hmm. than to the records from the, that we have from the Coon Massive. I don't know if I ever shared that with you because I didn't know that Marston's Mills River. Is that uh, significant? But if that yeah. heritage or history. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. I mean, we did find some wild trout there uh, back. Jose, there was like little indications of them back in the 1950s or before. Mm -hmm. But like I had been in there, I used to sample it for Marston's Mills River Day, where we used to stock brook trout every year, and I never got any brook trout. Um, and it's just that one time I sampled, I got an adult, and I'm like, okay, where there's one, there's probably more. Uh, and I went down to the area where I thought it's just above the mill pond and below a power line and I put a temperature sensor in there and the temperature sensor basically told me it was cold enough and then we went and electrofished in October and found the spent female um, multiple year classes. So I'm hopeful, you know, I don't know where we'd be in the sand to it, but there might be like a little tiny pocket of fish remaining and that's what I'm hoping. And I always tell people an anecdote about a little trout stream in Hingham, uh, which is my hometown. The guy told me about wild brook trout. We were there electroshocking, getting redfin pickerel, which is typical warm water fish. Uh, and when you know it, the guy that told me about it happened to come by. And he said, no, you got to go upstream. And sure enough, we went upstream and found wild brook trout. And so, but the brook trout are finding they have little, little <coughs> pockets of cold water habitat to survive. And that's why it's very important in the Kuna Messet to make some of this cold water refuge area. So even if the entire river isn't suitable for brook trout, if you can create these little pockets of cold water, you might be able to sustain a brook trout population in the lower river. From the uh, lessons you learned in Plymouth, mm -hmm. what type of channel geometry are you aiming for in Beaver Dam Brook, particularly with 
that I assume you said you want to make sure you get complete cover mm -hmm. in terms of overhanging vegetation. What kind of geometry do you mean? Uh, well, up there, it's, it's basically, it's, uh, the Tin Marsh is actually a privately owned cranberry bog. Uh, the Division of Ecological Restoration, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and a lot of other people are involved. Um, and so basically, they have simplified. That was one of the, you know, I was involved early on in some of the, the planning discussions. And, you know, one of the first things they talked about this long, sinuous channel. Uh, they've simplified the channel, straightened it out a little bit more, and put it closer to the edge. Uh, and so that's one of the things you look at, you know, the sinuous channel. Well, if it's that sinuous, that's more exposure to the sunlight, so it's going to be warmer. Uh, so sometimes, you know, you can cut down on that sinuosity and actually have better riparian habitat. Better. How, how wide? How wide? Uh, well, it's like one of the early indications here. It's about the width of the river down below the bogs. That was one of the studies that was done here, and that's kind of about the width that you would want in the Coonie Basset. So 10, 10 feet? Yeah, you want it a little bit variable. I mean, that's one of the things. The river is going to vary over time, uh, but you don't want it too wide, because the wider it is, the more exposed it will be to sunlight. And that's critical for these streams, is that uh, cutting down that exposure to the sun. Question? Uh, if you wanted to provide outreach to herring uh, run wardens, there is a very active uh, committee and network uh, called the River Herring Warden Network, which was formed in 2011, um, support from state and federal agencies, and they're very active. They meet each year for an annual meeting, and they were formed to um, uh, share and promote best management practices and learn about policy and science about managing uh, river herring. And I think, you know, um, there, there was a presentation by DER on yeah, cool. um, um, improving mm -hmm. or taking an ecological yeah. approach to herring run management. And I think you know, your presentation on what not to do mm -hmm. uh, in, for herring run management would be very useful for them to learn about. Right. Yeah, we're going to be working with them. Like I say, we started with Brad Chase. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually took Brad out to the uh, Red Brook, and he was going, a lot of herring wardens would cut that wood out. And I'm like, well, the herring get through here no problem at all. The, the River Herring Warden Network is uh, currently managed by Abigail Archer mm -hmm. at the Cape Cod Cooperative Extension and Woods Hole Sea Grant. Um, many herring wardens belong to it, and DMF and NOAA and Mass Bay's are advisory members. I'm a, I'm a yep. member of the steering I've been in many but meetings. it's a different way to mm -hmm. get uh, education uh, out there. Right. In fact, one of the things when we talked to Brad, I actually used a uh, slide from Russ Cohen's presentation right. of the herring wardens, and it showed the St. Tuart River, yep. this so. log with a chainsaw on it, and the log was cut. And I was looking at it, it as like, why do you have to cut that to allow a little herring? A herring can just go right behind, no problem. And a lot of it's education, just trying to you know address people's mindsets. In fact, uh, Jeff can tell you a story. While he was in there looking for an environmental DNA, he actually came upon about six people from uh, the town of Barstable in there with a chainsaw, rakes, everything else. And this was in November, right when the trout are most sensitive, where they're either spawning or the eggs are in the reds. And it's like why are you doing it now when over the winter all that stuff would probably fall in anyhow and the herring aren't going to be there until March or April. So a lot of it's education um, and that's one of the things hopefully, you know, presentations like this and other people, uh, we make people more aware of it. I mean, people generally try to do the right thing. Oftentimes they think they're doing the right thing, but they're not aware of all the other issues that are out there. I, I just want to point out to anybody who's interested that um, this, I, I work with the Kunameset River Restoration. I coordinate it. Steve actually has I've decided I'm going to continue working on this until we have sea run brook trout in Kunameset. Hopefully we have some now. Well, Maybe they drop down this winter. Not too far. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, well, that would be great. <laughs> but on April 2nd, there's um, uh, Nick Nelson from Interfloat. Who's, who's the river engineer for our lower bog dam removal and lower bog restoration, will be leading a field trip. And so it will be at lower bog dam 10 to 12 on Saturday, April 2nd. Good.
Because there's been a lot of progress here in the Kudamesh River. I have to applaud all the people of this group and other members of the town of Falmouth. There was a big controversy in town for many years. 